Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, we've got a special one for you. In this video, we're doing a collaboration with the channel All Time Tens. If you like this video, which is all about debunking medical myths, then please go check out another collaboration video that I made on their channel, which is called Top 10 Science Myths That Everyone Believes. I share the presentation on that one just like I do in this one, so it's very similar, kind of a nice related video. Definitely go check it out. There's a link in the description below. So, without much further ado, let me pass things over to my co-host for this episode and let's get things started myth shocking someone who was flatlined can get their heart started again while a flatlining person in movies will inevitably survive after a dramatic number of zaps and someone shouting live damn you in real life you'll be accomplishing nothing by shocking a flatline unless you like your meat well done, that is. When someone is in a systole, flat lined, there is no electrical differential that the monitor can pick up. Essentially, there are no specific electrolytes inside the cell compared to outside the cell with different electrical potentials to create an impulse. If you were attempted to shock this, you wouldn't be doing anything. There are simply no electrolytes to force out of the cell that are any different than the ones that are already outside the cell. All you would get is more flatline. In fact, after every shock ever given to someone in cardiac arrest, the rhythm created for a few seconds is a systole, with the heart rhythm temporarily stopped. It takes a few seconds for the normal pathways to get going again. If you had a systole before you shocked it, all you would do is burn the heart with the heat created from the shock. In the end, it's a Hollywood myth that you would treat a systole with a shock. You must first have some sort of electrical impulse to work with. Now there's a load of interesting details as to why this is the case, so Simon may cover it in an extra video if anyone's interested in the nitty gritty stuff on this one. Myth. Doctors are bound by the Hippocratic Oath. In fact, not only are they not bound by it, pretty much no one ever takes the actual Hippocratic Oath. You see, the ancient vow demands a lot from doctors, including a certain level of chastity, charity, and swearing to pagan gods. I swear by Apollo the Healer, by Asclepius, by Hygeia, by Bansia, and by all the gods and goddesses, making them my witnesses, that I will carry out, according to my ability and judgment, this oath and this indenture, to hold my teacher in this art equal to my own parents, to make him partner in my livelihood, when he is in need of my money to share mine with him, to consider his family as my own brothers, and to teach them this art if they want to learn it without fee or indenture, to impart precept, oral instruction, and all other instruction to my own sons, the sons of my teacher, and to indentured pupils who have taken the physician's oath, but to nobody else. I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so. Similarly, I will not give to a woman a pessary to cause abortion. I will not use the knife, not even verily, on sufferers from stone. Into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick, and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of man or woman, bond or free. And whatsoever I shall see or hear in the course of my profession, as well as outside my profession in my intercourse with men, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge, holding such things to be holy secrets. Now, although ancient, the oath was not actually used as a rite of passage in medical schools until 1508, when the University of Wittenberg first administered it. By 1804, it had been incorporated into the graduation ceremony of the medical school in Montpellier, France. However, it was still not commonly administered, and by the early 20th century, not even 20% of U.S. medical schools included the oath as part of their commencement ceremonies. As you might imagine, the restrictive ancient vow poses several problems for the modern practitioner, including the that the oath forbids physicians from using a knife. In ancient times, surgeries involving cutting someone would be performed by specialists such as barbers. Its prohibition against abortion wouldn't sit well with a significant percentage of doctors as well, and its restraint on euthanasia runs counter to the modern trend towards physician-assisted suicide. There's also the issue of making one's many teachers in medicine and their families akin to one's own family. I mean, that's certainly problematic. And of course, there are many people who would feel a bit weird swearing to Apollo, let alone the much lesser known gods that are also mentioned. 
On top of these, it's very common for doctors to give medical advice to those close to them, including spouses and sexual partners suffering from various ailments, which is seemingly prohibited by the oath. In any event, the majority of doctors do usually take some form of oath when they graduate from medical school, with this practice particularly being somewhat formalized and coming into vogue after World War II, in no small part in response to the atrocities committed by doctors in Nazi concentration camps in the name of advancing medical science. Even even where taking such an oath exists, however, the specific oath stated varies and is usually seen as ceremonial rather than necessarily binding. But whether a doctor takes the oath or not is kind of irrelevant these days because in most parts of the world there are specific laws which govern their conduct. Myth: Reading in dim light damages your eyes. In fact, the only damage reading in a dimly lit setting will do in comparison to reading in an ample lighted setting is to cause slightly more eye strain, which will go away simply by resting your eyes. This myth even made it onto a list of seven medical myths that doctors are most likely to believe, put together by the British Medical Journal in 2007. If you're curious about the other six myths listed, they are you need to drink at least eight glasses of water per day to stay hydrated, you only use 10% of your brain, hair and fingernails continue to grow after death, shaving makes your hair grow back faster, or thicker, eating turkey will make you drowsy, never heard of that one, and cell phones used in a normal way create enough electromagnetic interference to cause considerable problems with hospital equipment, creating false alarms, incorrect readings, and subsequent errors in treatment. All of those are false. In any event, to date, no scientific study has been able to conclusively show that reading in dim light hurts your eyesight long term, more than reading in an adequately lit area. Now, it should be noted that people who read a lot or otherwise focus on things close up for long periods of time, such as people who work on computers all day, do have a tendency to develop myopia. But dim lighting doesn't appear to make this tendency worse. Simply, that excessive reading seems to contribute to eventually developing nearsightedness. Why exactly this is the case isn't yet fully understood, but the leading theory is that the near constant straining of muscles focusing the eye, stretching the eyeball a bit over the years, gradually causes a permanent lengthening of the eyeball thus the person developing myopia as they age. Whether reading in low light or ample light for lengthy time frames, the resulting eye strain is not serious, and one simply needs to rest the eyes on occasion. You can do so by periodically taking a break from focusing on something close up, and instead looking at something far away, with the general rule being to take a break from focusing your eyes on close up things for a minute or two every 15 to 30 minutes. Closing your eyes for a minute at these intervals also helps because while reading, you typically blink about a quarter the amount you would normally do so, so your eyes can end up getting a bit dry. Myth: The oxygenated blood turns blue. People who often perpetuate this myth often claim that the reason we never see blood in its blue form is that the instant we get cut, the blood is exposed to oxygen and thus it instantly turns red. In reality, when blood is deprived of oxygen, it actually just turns dark red, similar to shades you've probably seen when donating blood. When the blood is oxygenated, it turns a brighter red, with the color primarily coming from hemoglobin. Myth. Humans have five senses. Overgeneralized to the point of being akin to the age old four elements fire, water, wind, and earth. In fact, humans do have quite a lot of senses, with the exact number not generally agreed upon, although everyone agrees it's way more than five. The classic human senses are summed up as sight, touch, taste, sound, and smell. The thing is, Technically, sight includes two distinct senses by two different receptors, cones and rods. Taste is often argued to be five senses by itself due to the differing types of taste receptors, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And this would probably be a good place to mention a bonus medical myth. No, contrary to popular belief, the tongue does not have distinct taste zones for these receptors, which anyone who's ever eaten anything should probably inherently realize, but nevertheless remains a pervasive myth because it was once commonly taught in schools, which often teach rote memorization over, you know, actual thinking. 
As for the touch sense, this is distinct from other sensors such as pressure, temperature, pain and even itch, which indeed uses its own dedicated receptors. Even if one wanted to just generalize those five, you'd still be missing a bunch though. For instance, there's prior proprioception, which is a system that gives you the ability to tell where your body parts are relative to other body parts. This sense is used all the time in little ways, such as when you scratch an itch on your foot, but never once look at your foot to see where your hand is relative to your foot. Then there's tension sensors found in such places as your muscles that allow the brain the ability to monitor muscle tension. Another is equilibrioception, allowing you to keep your balance and sense body movement in terms of acceleration and directional changes. Anyone who's ever had their sense go out on them on occasion knows how important this is. When it's not working or malfunctioning, you may literally not be able to tell up from down and moving from one location to another without aid is nearly impossible. Beyond these, there are several other distinct sensory systems built into our bodies, along with others that some medical professionals consider a sense, while others do not. For instance, some consider the group of systems that allow humans to accurately detect the passage of time innately to be a sense, chronoception, even though it's not a specific nerve type. Nevertheless, experimental data has conclusively shown that humans have a startlingly accurate sense of the passage of time, particularly when younger. For instance, in one experiment, a group of 19 to 24 year olds were able, on average, to tell when three minutes was up within a remarkably minuscule three second margin of error. There are also more distinct sensory systems that are still debated as to whether humans have them, such as magnetoreception. Many living things do possess this sense, but with humans, the jury is still out. Experiments done placing a strong magnetic field near a person and then disorienting them have shown people do typically perform worse at reorienting themselves to cardinal points than people who are not near a strong magnetic field. Other experiments with similarly promising, though not conclusive results, as to whether we have magnetoreception include putting humans in a pitch black room and rotating a magnetic field around them while monitoring brain activity. Myth: Drinking Mountain Dew lowers sperm count. Mountain Dew has numerous ingredients, but the two that are almost always cited as being the culprit for lowering sperm count among Mountain Dew drinkers are caffeine and yellow dye number 5, also known as tartrazine. Tartrazine is actually a part of another myth which says that it actually shrinks your penis. Totally not true. In any event, let's start with caffeine. Mountain Dew contains 54 milligrams of caffeine in a 12 ounce can. The average cup of drip coffee has about 217 milligrams per 12 ounces. This is about four times more than the Mountain Dew. So if caffeine was actually a problem for sperm counts, then most of us would have a far bigger problem than drinking Mountain Dew. So what science actually says about caffeine consumption and sperm quality? is pretty mixed, though they do tend towards there being no effect. The caveat is that some studies do show that extreme intake of caffeine does correlate with lower sperm production. However, it is also noted that high caffeine intake from things such as excessively drinking caffeinated cola of any type or coffee almost always correlates with many other unhealthy habits such as smoking, poor eating habits, and intemperate alcohol consumption. This all makes it unclear whether excessive caffeine intake and lowered sperm count is a correlation or an actual causation, with most medical professionals leaning towards the former. It should also be noted that even if by some chance it was a causation, not a correlation thing, when looking at the studies that did show lowered sperm counts with excessive caffeine intake, you'd have to drink on the order of at least a dozen cans of Mountain Dew per day to have an effect, and important to the topic at hand, this wouldn't be unique to Mountain Dew, though it does have slightly higher caffeine content than most Sodas. As for the motility of sperm, the general consensus, based on studies done so far, is that caffeine intake has little to no effect, though sperm directly exposed to caffeine in a lab actually see an increase in motility, which would probably actually be helpful in fertilization. Alright, so let's move on to tartrazine, which is also known as yellow dye number 5. Now, The European Food Safety Authority in 2009 looked into tartrazine and its possible effects on fertility and found no adverse effects on reproduction or development. They even tested people at rates as high as 1,225 milligrams per kilogram and still found nothing. 
So for a 175 pounds or 80 kilogram person, that would be about 97 grams. Myth. Cockroaches are near the top of the food chain when it comes to surviving ionizing radiation. You've probably heard that the only living things that would survive a nuclear war would be cockroaches and share. It's even been suggested that cockroaches can survive the amount of radiation at ground zero of a nuclear explosion, though of course not the explosion itself if they were right next to it, assuming they weren't in a lead-lined refrigerator, then of course they'd definitely survive as would humans. While cockroaches can withstand ionizing radiation bursts about 10 times as high as humans, they actually are relative lightweights in that arena. In fact, it only takes a burst of around 1,000 rads to significantly interfere with the cockroach's ability to reproduce, which would obviously be the eventual end of the cockroach if they were all exposed to this level. For reference, this is about the level of radiation at around 15 miles from Hiroshima directly after the nuclear bomb was detonated. Further at bursts of around 6,400 rads, about 94% of immature cockroaches will die. And at around 10,000 rads, most adult cockroaches will not survive. While this is very impressive by human standards, humans only being able to survive about 400 to 1,000 rads, it's decidedly unimpressive by insect standards, with most such creatures able to survive much higher rates, according to the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, who, when they aren't spending their time trying to spit out their name, apparently enjoy zapping various living things with ionizing radiation. So who are the actual living creatures that would inherit the Earth after a worldwide nuclear war? Well, it's been shown that fruit flies take around 64,000 rads to kill. More impressive than that is the flower beetle, which can withstand up to around 100,000 rads before dying. This bacteria can survive radiation bursts as high as 1.5 million rads at room temperature, and nearly 3 million when frozen, such as during a hypothetical nuclear winter. This all comes with a caveat, however. The primary reason cockroaches and many types of insects are much more resistant to ionizing radiation than humans is that their cells don't divide that much between molting cycles. Cells are most susceptible to damage by ionizing radiation when they are dividing. Given that a typical cockroach only molts about once a week and its cells only divide around a 48 hour period during that week, about three quarters of the cockroaches exposed to bursts in the lab would not be particularly susceptible to damage by ionizing radiation, at least relative to those whose cells are currently dividing. This means that if the radiation experienced by these cockroaches and other insects was consistent over a long period of time, even when not factoring in cumulative buildup, they are going to be significantly more susceptible to problems than the numbers previously quoted, which were using specific bursts of radiation over a short span. The idea that cockroaches are the founders of the Ionizing Radiation Survival Fan Club was largely popularized by anti-nuclear activists in the 1960s, who often used the cockroach in their slogans and campaigns. Myth. You can swallow your tongue and have it get stuck. Contrary to popular belief, it is not possible to swallow your tongue. Well, unless, of course, you cut it off and then swallowed it, but other than that, like every muscle in your body, your tongue is attached. Most pertinent to the topic at hand is a handy little thing known as your frenulum linguae, which keeps your tongue from folding backwards too far, thus making it unable to be swallowed and certainly meaning it can't get stuck in your throat. Even if a person is lying on their back and happens to be one of the exceptionally few individuals where the combination of tongue length and location where the frenulum linguae attaches makes it possible for the tongue to fall back into the airway somewhat, the problem doesn't require any special tools to fix, nor will the tongue get stuck, as is often the perception. Just roll the person onto their side and the tongue will flop over, gravity doing its wonderful work. Or if the person is conscious, they can manipulate the tongue using, you know, their tongue. And this brings us to the next myth, which is something of an offshoot of this myth. Myth. You should put a bite block in the mouth of someone who is suffering from a seizure. Before we get started, it should be noted that there are many different types of seizures, producing a wide range of symptoms. The type that most people think of when saying seizure is known as tonic-clonic seizures. In these cases, the presumed benefit of a bite block is to keep the victim from swallowing their tongue and having it get stuck. 
although that's not possible as previously noted, or to keep them from biting it. Unlike the first problem, the second issue of the individual biting their tongue is very real, but the risk of putting any bite block in the mouth of a person having a tonic cloning seizure far outweighs the benefit of preventing a bitten tongue or cheek. The first risk is to the rescuer. Try pulling open the person's mouth to get something between their teeth and you might end up on YouTube with the video going viral because your finger was near bitten off. Though if you happen to have had this happen to you and have footage, maybe send it our way. We've got to pay the bill somehow and we're not proud. The second problem is to the person experiencing the seizure. Numerous seizure patients have lost teeth due to helpful citizens placing objects in their mouths during the seizure. Further, due to how hard some seizure patients can potentially breathe on occasion, those teeth may become aspirated and end up in their lungs. And the object itself that's placed in the mouth might be bitten in half, also potentially resulting in aspiration. In either case, while the tongue itself may well get chomped on if you do nothing, you likely only increase the risk of injury or even the person choking to death by attempting to stop this from happening. In the end, this myth so often perpetrated by Hollywood is one you should never try. Unless, of course, you want to explain to the paramedics why the seizure patient is now choking on the part of the pen you placed in their mouth. Now that we've dispelled the myth of bite blocks, let's talk about what you should do in case you come across someone seizing in this fashion. First, remove any dangerous objects that might injure them, glasses on their face, sharp objects in their pockets, etc. Second, pad around the person to keep them from striking any hard objects nearby. If you can, place a pillow or folded soft jacket under their head to help protect them from hitting it against the ground. Third, place the person on their side. This could be difficult during the seizure, so you may have to wait until they've done convulsing. By placing them on their side, this will allow any vomit or other fluids to drain out onto the ground, while simultaneously keeping their airway open. Lastly, after the seizure, most people have an altered mental state and can sometimes do unpredictable things. Try and keep them from doing anything that might hurt themselves, like running into traffic. Myth: Drinking alcohol warms your body and can be used to prevent hypothermia. In fact, drinking alcohol actually helps lower the core temperature of your body. Alcohol is a vasodilator, meaning that it causes your blood vessels to dilate, particularly the capillaries under the surface of your skin. Thus, the volume of blood brought to the skin's surface increases, making you feel warm. This overrides one of your body's defenses against cold temperatures, constricting your blood vessels, thereby minimizing blood flow to your skin in order to keep your core body temperature up. While you may feel warmer from the extra blood warming your skin, where most of your heat sensors are located, this blood being brought close to the surface of your skin will rapidly cool if you are in a cold environment, sometimes exacerbated by sweating as a result of this heat flush. The net effect is a rapid drop in core body temperature, often without you even realizing it, as your skin will continue to feel fairly warm, which makes it doubly dangerous to drink alcohol in extremely cold weather. On top of this, drinking alcohol in cold weather also reduces the body's ability and tendency to shiver taking away yet another method your body uses to help keep warm when it is actually cold. So the bottom line is the age-old practice of drinking alcoholic beverages to keep the body warm in cold weather is the exact opposite of what you actually should be doing. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. As I mentioned at the top, it was a collaboration with All Time Tens. I've done a video over on their channel, a collaboration just like this, so I'd really love it if you went over and checked it out. I'm linking to it on the screen now, and there's also a link in the description below. Go check it out. If you love All Time Tens stuff, which I'm sure you will do, please do subscribe to their channel and support them. They're uh, good friends of our channel, and we love making collaborations like this with good guys like All Time Tens. So thanks to them for this collaboration, and thank you for watching.